world, my name is Data Mining Mike, and on this episode of the podcast, we are going to talk about how to increase your Google business profile. Today's guest is a technician who specializes in Google reviews, Lisa Seiler. Lisa is a fond of tactical knowledge for organic Google review growth and improvement. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction, you will be able to take what you have learned and apply it to your brand or business, and that is called value. And because of that, you should like this video. Remember that sharing is caring. Check out Lisa's contact information in the video description below, and please subscribe, smash bell for more data-driven updates. You know what's one thing I like about Costco? The older I get, the hot dogs stay the same price. And for that reason, if you own a home, you should sell your home today and put it all into Costco stock, ticker symbol COST. Could you imagine America without this dividend aristocrat? Costco stock trades at 41 times earnings. That means that people are willing to pay 41 times the actual price that it produces, ticker symbol COST. Excellent. Yeah, I'm just trying to get, you know, a good shot of you with the elk rack. Sure. That's, that's what the people want. They want big, big elk racks. <laughs> All right, there. We are live. So All right. So tell the world awesome. about you, Lisa, everybody. All right. Now, nice to meet you. I'm Lisa Seiler, and I am the president of a little business called Great Reviews, which is powered by Ready Reviews. And what I do is I help businesses maximize their Google reviews. And a lot of businesses don't even realize like that there's something out there that you can do and it's a software based thing. It's all done for you. You have to do little to nothing to make it happen. Literally, if you can sit down and you can upload a, a customer list with emails, we can get more Google reviews. And people don't realize that the world the yellow pages of today is Google. And if there's anything that Amazon taught us, it's never do anything with any business until you've read their reviews. And so there's lots and lots of customers out there scrolling through reviews, but businesses are trying to do, whether it's a, you know, the contractors are trying to build the decks and the garages and the, and the guys, you know, putting in windows are trying to put in their windows and the person doing the dog grooming is trying to do their dog grooming. A lot of times reviews just gets overlooked. And so that's why we came up with a system that is done for you. And that just helps the businesses to maximize that review process. And a lot of these smaller businesses might be sitting out there with less than 30 reviews. Well, that could be your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your uncle, your cousin. And our, the customers don't, statistically speaking, don't have a lot of trust until you get up over 30 reviews. And once you get to that point, what happens is a negative review affects you less. And that's really what's sad is when you get one person that just decides they're going to lob a rotten egg at a business just because they had a bad day. And maybe the employee had a bad day. Who knows? But if that happens and the business doesn't have very many business um, very many reviews. <laughs> well, well, no, keep talking. Okay, so that that was just because yeah, I only filmed for like three minutes. Yeah, so I get a solid, you know. Yeah, so do you want me to to restart? No, or, keep okay, going. yeah. Just so if a if a business gets a negative review, it can really ding their online reputation. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. And that's one of the things that I try to help with is the more good reviews we can have that we can get built up ahead of time, the better they're set to where if somebody lobs a rotten egg, it washes off a lot more quickly. And one of the things that happens with uh, a negative review is it takes 30 positive reviews on average to get one point back on your score. And so if somebody's sitting out there with say eight or 10 or 12 reviews, then a couple of negatives can really become a problem. And also Google has an algorithm that tells most relevant. And so if you can get your customers talking and they, and they get verbose about the things that they really do love, some people are just chattier than others. And unfortunately, a business that's not out there pursuing reviews, the person who's going to be chatty is the person that's having a bad day. 
And that's the person that goes out there and like, well, I didn't like it. And this is what I thought was wrong. And then that becomes your most relevant review. And it's like, it's stuck. And it's like this giant blemish on your online reputation. So we try and help businesses with that. It's the old Zig Ziglar quote, which says, if you help enough people get what they want, you can have everything that you want. And so that's what I try to do with ready reviews is just get out there with businesses and say, hey, we can help with this. Put it, put your customer's name and emails in there. We've got a kiosk mode where all they have to do is enter the name and email and the person gets an email automatically. Then at the cust- at, at their leisure, emails we find work better than text for getting reviews because then at their leisure, they're sitting down. And if you think about it, you might get a text and you're driving or you're doing something else and you mean well and you're going to get back to it, but that's a lot more difficult than if you get it while you're reading your emails, you're probably sitting down, relaxed and able to take the time to go and do that. And I think that statistically speaking, over 80% of people will read a re- will write a review if they're asked, but they have to be asked at the proper time and the, the proper mode. We even have a way to delay it for say a couple of days or a week if they enter, like as you're dealing with a customer, if you're a business owner, you can put their their name and email in of the customer. They can either get a review that re- request immediately or say we can wait eight hours or it can wait a week, depending on what type of industry you're in. If somebody's just bought a new car, you might want to send that review out three days because then they've figured out all the bells and whistles and they're really in that mode of just loving that car. And they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to write this review. And uh, so I love doing that for businesses because that makes a permanent difference because reviews are like graffiti and it's indelible ink and it's going to stay online and it's going to become part of that business's reputation years down the road. And unfortunately, with the way the algorithms are set up, like people can go on there and they can immediately look at the most negative review and they can see how long ago it was. And so the more of the things that we can push to the push down with good reviews, if somebody's got, say, five negatives, but 500 positives, then no big deal. Nobody's going to really give much credence to the five negative people because you can't please everybody. But if those same five negatives are on there and the business only has 20 reviews overall, then that becomes a problem. I was just, I looked at a business, uh, just a business in Coeur d'Alene. They had 11 reviews in the past year, which is a terribly low number because we know they've got more than that as far as customers go. Um, That reminds me, I gotta silence this. (laughs) I don't want background noise on you. And, uh, I was going to do that before I came in. No worries. So <clears throat> reviews. So you were helping this Coeur d'Alene restaurant get more reviews. Yeah, it was a, it was, there's a, uh, a, a business in Coeur d'Alene that has 11 uh, reviews in the past year, which is a very, very low number. But what's worse is five out of the 11 are negative. And so I have the ability then to, uh, they're not, they're not with me yet. And that's why I'm not like name names or anything, but I'm, I'm able to go to them and say, Hey, listen, this is how we can help you. I do have a, a, a business that is working with me out of Spirit Lake. Uh, I, I approached the owner of the, of the, um, restaurant and he had had a general manager manager earlier. He, he had a general manager earlier in the year that he actually had to let go. And he had gotten several negative reviews because of her bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And he was tickled because he's like, finally, a method to start overcoming that and to get that traction back. Because a lot of these people are good people and they own great businesses. And there's just been like a, I won't call it a streak of bad luck because I don't really believe in luck. But there's been just a series of unfortunate events that caused them to suddenly have this behind the eight ball problem with their with their review process. Whether it's not enough reviews or worse yet, not enough reviews and some negatives, we can kind of, you know, boost that. And a lot of businesses that are super busy right now are totally missing the boat by not getting the reviews because that becomes insurance against later on if if you do get a bad review then something can co- go in and th- it will just make a tiny little ding. It won't make this giant crater in your online reputation. So, and the other thing that we have that's really a neat part of the software is let's say you own a restaurant and you're having a slow week and, um, or better yet, something, let's take something appointment based like a, a, a dog groomer, for instance, and let's say that you're, you're having a slow season because a holiday is coming up. You have, we have a campaign 
uh, setting that is like, almost like what Constant Contact does, where they can choose anyone who has had their dog groomed within like two months ago to one month ago. I'm going to send them, because it'd be about time for them to be groomed again. I'm going to send them a little message saying, hey, if you book between this day and this day, when you've got kind of a slow week, I'll give you free hair bow or, you know, a free, you know, nail trim for the dog or what have you and so that enables people to kind of fill in the gaps and the slow spots or if a restaurant was say having a, a slow time of let's say they found out that man there's just nobody coming into our restaurant on tuesday afternoons then you could do a special for the month of october and send it to everybody that ate at your restaurant in the past like three months and say hey we're having an october special if you come on on tuesdays between two and five you'll get a free appetizer with the purchase of a meal or your choice of a free app or a free dessert that kind of things makes it all possible all built in and done for you all you have to decide is who you want to send it to and what you want the special to be so yeah i really like it it's it, i just think it's a good way to help the little guy gain i mean big businesses can use it too but especially it seems like the little guy that doesn't have an entire it's like a marketing team in the box mm -hmm. and it and it dovetails with like if somebody's already got somebody working on their google optimization or website optimization this doesn't have to replace any of that it just dovetails with it and just rolls right out mm -hmm. cool so, so how did you get started in this I uh, came in off an ad. They're looking for sales pros. I've been 25 years uh, in another business teaching fire safety. And maybe we'll do another podcast about that because October's fire safety month and we can do lots of cool tips and ideas of getting the, the word out for that. And so it's I fire love fire safety month. October is. Yep. Didn't know that. Yep. October's fire safety month. And um, the third week of October is national fire safety week. Hmm. And so, Yep. Huh. I think yeah. September is Carbon Monoxide Awareness Month. They do a spring and a fall one. And I think that's what September is. And so, yeah, I've I've got 25 years of knowledge of, of, you know, how fire affects people and how it moves through a home and how smoke detectors work and what carbon monoxide does, does to our bodies and all of that. So I like working with people. And I was looking for something that just to kind of just to kind of supplement what I'm doing already and it's a it's a independent contractor kind of thing and so I was like man that sounds really cool and I already have some business to business experience from when I was back in Michigan and so I was like well this is something my passion is helping people always has been always will be and I've been on missions trips I work with my church I'm always looking to find a way to give back and so I thought well this is kind of cool because I can make a living by giving back Mm -hmm. so good yeah that that seems like a lot of it, it's a lot of fun i've i've had experience in the world of google reviews too i could talk at length about that but um tell me about tell me about how long you've been in washington state well i'm actually in idaho i'm oh, over yeah. in priest river well, yeah oh, right. and i came to idaho the first time i ever set foot set foot in idaho was memorial day of 2020 and it's kind of an ironic story. I came out to meet a friend at that time, and who is now my husband, of course. And uh, I was supposed to come out to Utah for, as part of the fire safety business, the only business, the only office that has stayed open through the whole of COVID was our office in Utah. And they were having a compliance meeting. And so we were all going to go learn. And then their compliance people found out that we were coming in from out of state and decided we had to quarantine for, for 10 days for a 10-day meeting. And it's like, if I need to be quarantined, I can stay home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and But I'd already planned the trip. And because COVID did a lot of things, especially from the Michigan end of things and from the international end of things, my trip to Idaho coincided with a trip to uh, to Scotland that got canceled. So I needed like the, the time away in the trip. So I took it anyways, even though it wasn't to, to do as many things as I thought I was going to do. Mike says, hey, if you're coming out this far, you know, come one extra hour, we'll do lunch. Now, it was originally supposed to be lunch in Spokane, turned into 14 days hanging out in North Idaho. And, uh, and so that was kind of how the... The whole thing started. It didn't take very long after meeting the man in per person and, and seeing the wonderful beauty of the Northwest. I was starstruck and I was totally and completely infatuated and fell in love. And, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. I went, I ended up staying for the entire summer because mm -hmm. Michigan had nothing for me to go back to. We still couldn't go in and out of houses. And the lockdown there was so much more extreme than here. And 
I love the kind of the thoughts and attitudes of, of just if you if you want to put a mask on or do whatever the mandates say, fine, if you want to live and let live, but don't don't force somebody else to do it. And so Michigan was not that way. Michigan actually had groups that were going around um, basically persecuting small business owners for not not enforcing mask mandates and not enforcing social distancing and painting circles on the floor. And they, they felt all entitled and there was all the virtual signaling going on. And so the culture out here was really another thing that drew me. And so it's like when he popped the question and I'm like, wait a minute, I get Idaho out of the deal. At, at that time, I had already been out here for three months because I had gotten little odd jobs and found that people were kind of, you know, the, the economy out here was better than it was in Michigan. And so I flew back, spent a couple months buttoning my house up, flew him out to Michigan and married him October 20th of 2020, and then immediately flew back and been here ever since. Yeah, that's fun to always find that thrill of new excitement. Yeah, life. yeah, I'm I'm an adventure seeker. Um within reason. I'm cautious, mm-hmm. but I but I do enjoy like meeting new people and and, and that, that's one of the things that's neat about this job is I can I can find a new business and I can go and I can kind of give them a little business report card if you will. And that's one of the things mm-hmm. that I offer as a as a free free service. A lot of times I walk in, I've got one sitting here. I, I want you to I brought the the QR code for you to have so you can have oh, it all in the Yay. links for the video yeah, and all that. The camera. And uh I'm going to show that to there the camera. Go. And I'll get you my, it's on my digital business card as well. And, um, but this one on the, on the back of when I run across the new business, a lot of times this one's for a place called Red, Retrofit Athletics. And I noticed from her reviews that her name is Megan. She has a perfect score of 5.0, but she's only got eight reviews. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, surely you have many more happy customers that are keeping you a secret with only eight reviews. Just one angry bird can really leave you a rotten egg. Let's build this up now so that that can't happen later. And the really cool thing that our software has is a gatekeeper that keeps any review of less than three stars that is entered through our system does not go on to Google. It goes to the owner of the business. So they get a chance to deal with it and fix the problem. So I talk to business owners all the time that are just like, you know, it just stinks because people go on Google and just blah, 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 and verbally vomit all over the internet when really what they want to do is like, tell me if there's a problem and I'll make it right. And so this gives them the opportunity to turn that that review around and to make it right with the customer, which is generally what the customer wants, but they don't know that they want it until it's offered to them. Cool. Yeah. And so, and that, that I think is, especially if we have a, a uh, say there's a restaurant or something that has high turnover and they're still training some of their staff, mistakes happen. But I'm sure they would rather give that customer a free soft drink or dessert or appetizer for their next visit and then turn that review into a positive one and then, you know, go through go that way. Okay, cool. Yeah, I remember there's this guy, Dave Shotwell, the best Spokane probate attorney 2023. Either way, when I first met him, he was a he was a lowly 2.1. Didn't care at all about his Google business reviews. And then I figured out how to get rid of negative reviews and moved him up to like a 4.2. Isn't, doesn't that feel satisfying? Yeah. I mean, it's like I, I worked with a guy from uh, Sylvan Learning Centers and in, in four days, their Google ranking jumped them over Mathnasium. Even though Mathnasium had been around longer and had more reviews, they were getting the new fresh reviews. And so that was was raising their rank. And so it was neat to see like concrete results. Cool. Yeah, I found if you want to get rid of a negative review, report it as spam. Okay, that does help some. Yeah, it's reported as spam. You can report one as spam once every quarter. And then with negative reviews too, those are good because they give you a chance to respond. Yep. And therefore you can plug all the keywords in that you want to jam in. Yeah, that's cool. So do you guys have a keyword? Like, do you give us customer suggestions of what they should talk about? We do. We, we coach, like when I, when I have a a new uh, restaurant or whatever business it is, I do some research for like their best keywords for their specific industry. And then I also show them how, like, for instance, let's say it's a restaurant 
Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, you want words on there like best food or appetizer or steak or whatever they're known for. I will sh- help them develop uh, like contest among their servers to say, all right, make sure they're mentoring the name of the server, make sure they're mentioning what they ordered and make sure that they're talking about great food or great service or clicking little check boxes. And then I would, I would show them how to contest the servers. And a lot of times it's, it's something simple. It's having your name on the wall and getting a carnation, you know, with a little, little thing that says, thank you. And I'm all about like edification and helping them build like morale within their business and so that's just kind of one of the other fun things that I like to do. It's not officially a great review service, but it's just like, I like coaching. I like being part of, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of my business family, you know, and just kind of being able to work with them and say, okay, how about this? How about that? And, and just, and, and watching their eyes light up when they see their numbers of reviews just going up, 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 up. That's, that's kind of fun because you're just like, wow, we've been out in business how many years and you've been able to, to really maximize this. Cool. Good. Yeah. So tell me about how do you go about approaching businesses? Um, I do as a, so several ways. A lot of times I look for businesses that are already running an ad because that tells me that they're hungry for business. And so I might see their ad on Facebook or, or sponsorship on Google or uh, maybe in the even in the in print media. And I will do just, you know, like I've got here on this little card is I'll look at them. And I'll, I'll evaluate them. And I'll see where they're at. What is their what is their biggest area of need? A lot of times I think because they're busy running their business, they're not really sitting down and going, oh, what, what does my, my Google reviews really need? And so I'll go, to, go through and I'll kind of have an idea. Okay, this is, this is where you need to be. Here's where you're at. Here's where you need to be. You've been in business. How long? Why are you only getting one review a month or one review every week? Or you know, why is there not more? And I think a lot of it is they just don't know how to ask. And so I've, uh, some of the, some of the contacts, depending on where they're at, it might be by telephone. Uh, I really like to just go out and beat the streets and just, I'll, I'll drive past a business and I'll look them up and I'll, and I'll say, okay, here's where they're at. Here's where they're, they're want to be. And sometimes you can tell, you can tell if a business already kind of has a grasp and you can also tell if a business is just like grasping at straws because I've seen some businesses that are like very, they respond to the good ones and the bad ones but they've only got a handful. And so it's like, man, all they need to know is how to ask. And then their rank would be much higher than it is because if the business ahead of them on Google gets called and gets a customer, that's a customer that they could have had. And that's a customer that they deserve. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to kill the camera real quick. because It's going to be going for 20 minutes. So 18 minutes. Nice. Good. Good, I can itch my nose now. Yeah, that'll save me <laughs> computational time. And I find that, like, once the camera's out of people's faces, it feels more comfortable. Yeah, that's that's not why. bad. With that being such a handy little camera, you yeah. do kind of forget that it's there, especially once the little screen goes off. I like that. The, I'm sure it saves you battery life with a little yeah. screen off anyways. It's just computational time for me to process all this. Uh, like, if I was to run a two-hour-long right video that would take like six hours for me to upload six hours just to process so it's like yeah and that's not even editing that's just upload right yeah that's just uploading yeah that's down that's creating and then the uploading process yeah yeah it is what it is but hey i'm i'm happy i'm doing how long have you been podcasting i started my first podcast was this guy nick allard and we I've been podcasting since January. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so you, this is your first year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is my first year podcasting. So I, I realized I, I just wanted to do a podcast. Yeah. I just wanted to start one. I think that it's fun and it's opened a lot of doors and has gotten access to people that I would have never gotten access right? to because everybody comes at, other business owners or people with some sort of like a sell right or something. But I'm just like, no, I just want your keywords and your story associated with me. Yeah. And we all rise together. Right. One hand washes the other and both hands wash the face. Yeah. What I want is that one, you know, those people 
I th- this is what I do it for. I do it for that one guest that will have that one story that resonates with more people than I could ever get. Yeah. You know, that's what I want. Very cool. Yeah. Well, and I've got I've got so many different stories from so many different facets of of life, whether it's, you know, Mike and I met online dating, but we weren't really on a dating site, you Mm -hmm. know? So, you know, there's the, the, you know, there's that whole story. And then, like I said, international travel is another one. Ministry is another one. Motivation is another one. Um, I just, I just kind of composed, if you will, a five minute uh, little mini podcast of, of weeding your list. No, not reading and mispronouncing it, but weeding, weeding. like making this giant list of everything you want to do, mm-hmm. but then pulling the weeds in it because everybody is capable of making a list they could never, ever complete. And uh, the, the, the real key to, I think, to success is being able to figure out which items on the on the list take priority, which items are good ideas, but not not really going to produce what you're after in life, and which items are like not any fun but need to be done to to get where you want to go, and so it's just like pulling weeds in a garden. You have to sit down, you have to sit with your list, and you have to sit there and go, okay, what stays, what goes, and you can have a secondary list, so you don't have to forget about those things. You don't have to hit the delete button, but you got to move them off, and you got to say, okay, let's revisit this. Are there any of these that have risen in level of importance? And then let's go through the list of things that I've got to get done, because I know some people, and I'm not opposed to this idea, but there are people that will do something, then write it on the list just for the satisfaction of crossing it off, mm-hmm. and that's fine. I think that that's, that's the feel-good aspect, and there's there's nothing wrong with that, but at the same time, you have to put the things that you really don't enjoy doing, the things you wouldn't automatically naturally do. And I'm not saying this because I'm perfect at it. I don't think anybody really is because human nature, we're procrastinators, and I'm not a natural list maker. And so making lists, I always kind of prided myself in uh, being able to remember everything without writing it down and having a really good memory, memorize a lot of Bible verses growing up, stuff like that. And... Um, but I've even read, it's actually one of the things I, that kind of got me thinking about making the list and, and writing that little mini podcast was because of some of the reviews that I read on the coffee shop. The coffee shop was like, we really wish the barista would have written down our orders, even though we're kind of thinking she got it right. There was four people in our party and we would rather have accuracy than be impressed by her memorization ability. And so it's just, I think that says something about our society too, is it used to be like, oh, wow, she's a wonderful server if she can remember without a list. Now I think we have different ex- expectations of people. It's like we have all the technology that like writing stuff down and having it in front of you is almost expected mm. as opposed to, you know, it's weird. It's like GPS made me road dumb. Mm. I used to be able to tell you like this road, that road, that road, that road, just because I would be driving by and reading the road signs all the time. We don't do that anymore. We, the same way calculators make us number dumb and smartphones make us telephone dumb because I used to have everybody's number memorized. And now I have like mine and my husband's and my mom's. It's like everybody else is just like, I don't know, speed dial in their name. And uh, it's just, a, it's a different day and age. Mm-hmm. It certainly is. Mm-hmm. And the question is, how much more of your thinking are you willing to give up to a machine? That is a good question, but if you're putting that same thinking into use in other positive, creative ways, you know, as, as long as that machine's not taking over anything, and I kind of feel like a smartphone, I store my numbers in there so I don't have to waste the brain space on them. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, as long as I have them somewhere in hard copy that, that I can take it off and store it and, and, you know, be able to get back to it if I ever did have to go back and manually enter stuff, then, and that's the hard thing to remember is just that, that you know, in a, in a, in a grid down situation or, or a, you know, you drop your phone. My, <laughs> I knew a lady that uh, went into a, uh, a Porta john mm-hmm. and proceeded to set her phone next to the toilet and stood up and knocked the thing in. Mm-hmm. So that phone was no more. And so she had to go to with her backups and all of that. And so it's kind of funny. I can't hardly use a porta john without thinking about that story and <laughs> how bad that would be to have that. You're not, you're not going fishing there to find your phone. No. And, uh, you know, so just the, the, I guess a lot of it, like anything else, it's what you do with it, 
nothing I don't think that there's anything inherently good or bad about any technology except you, know, you get too far deep into some of the AI and, and stuff I won't let you know there's 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 limits you think you have to be smart and wise but I don't think anything by itself is good or bad it's how it's used mm-hmm. yeah which makes me think about you talking about the lady dropping her phone in the toilet in the porta shitter and I think about how Tesla fires mm. Tesla fires and EV fires since October is going to be fire month yes what is your experience with the world of electronics and electronic fires? It is a lot more common than people realize because the big tech companies that are building these things try to try to bury it. Mm-hmm. And that is why we have consumer product safety commissions and places like that where that force them into doing recalls. And unfortunately, the even the media outlets a lot of times have to be almost cajoled into talking about things that things that are life or death things that are making our safety the big thing like the lithium batteries Mm -hmm. if you the fire department um i want to say it was portland fire department but i'm not positive but they did a uh expose where they filmed a living room that had a one of those um hoverboards and they filmed that sucker catching on fire and a lot of people all of a sudden were like wow that went a lot faster than I realized. I didn't realize we're talking about explosions as these things get hotter. And it's like, never plug one of those things in inside the house. Charge your hoverboard out in your garage or outside of the of the house. You know, in your case, like an apartment, I'd even say, you know, put a spot on the patio or something to where you could charge something like that. And if it did catch fire, it's going to be outside the house instead of inside at least an attached garage, you have a firewall. But a lot of times, now I'm getting kind of onto my other other passion, which is fire safety. If you don't know that fire is going on, you can't do anything about it. Mm-hmm. But it, it's kind of interesting how that parallels. Because if you don't know that you, a lot of people just leave, leave their Google reviews alone mm-hmm. and they don't even look at them. And so they could have two or three negatives sitting out there, not even responded to. And if you don't know it's a problem, then you can't deal with it. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times it's just making people realize here's what could be the problem. Deal with it before it's a problem. Bulletproof yourself. And then it's like you're insured, but it doesn't cost you like an arm and a leg to do either because yeah. reviews are free. That's true. A lot of business owners, they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. I didn't know what I didn't know like four years ago. I didn't know half of what I know now. Right. Because I didn't care to pursue it. Or you don't think about what you don't think about. Right. And that is important. You do need to respond to any review because what they're doing, that customer, even if they're trying to screw you, they're giving you a digital asset. And that digital asset, even if it's one star, you can respond with as many keywords as you want. And I've also seen uh, business owners that like it's like you just want to look at them and pat them on the head and say oh dear you are trying but you're so doing it wrong like i actually read one the other day that was somebody left them a one-star review and they basically started out by saying well we hope you enjoyed leaving a one-star review and not even telling us your real name it is like with an attitude and i'm just like you guys that restaurant ended up going out of business and i was just like well it's not much wonder they're out of business because they did not have anybody coaching them to say okay you know let's let's change this let's let's do let's do something different even if let's say it was changed a month after they had put up their response anybody seeing it in the future isn't going to go like well that was a really snarky response and one of the things that's weird about the whole digital age in social media is people will say things that they would never say to somebody's face Mm-hmm. digitally like yeah. the, people are 10 foot tall and bulletproof and you have to remember that when as a business owner when you're responding you need to be the one that just floods them with grace that says oh my gosh so sorry you feel this way we want to make it right we we value you as a customer the the customer is always right hasn't changed but a lot of times because 
the business owners see that 10 foot tall and bulletproof, they want to respond with I'm bigger than you are or, you know, and it, it is true. People, people are idiots for leaving a negative review, a cowardly way. They'll go and make a, a, a Google profile that only has that one review because they don't want to associate it with who they really are. And yes, that is a sleazeball move, but for a business owner to call them out on that doesn't, doesn't help anybody. The business owner might feel better, but that's essentially leaving the customer a negative review and it just digs a deeper hole. Yeah. As you're talking, that made me think about this really popular Mexican restaurant that in East Wenatchee, Washington, that we used to love to go to. And it was called Casa Tapatia. It was authentic Mexican food. It was great. It operated for years. They were pulling a lot of revenue. And one day they had a worker who had an issue and the worker filmed the back kitchen area while apparently making authentic Mexican food means running on authentic Mexican kitchen (laughs) like in Mexico. (laughs) And that worker filmed how dirty it was and the health department shut that place down quick. Oh, no. Quick. Within a week. Then they went back into business again. Same people. Different name. Then they got shut down. But, yeah. No. It goes back to the power of one person. Bad word travels farther than good word. And it travels a lot farther and a lot faster. A lot faster. I heard it once said, and I really believe it's true, that bad bad news gets around the world before good news gets its boots on. Mm, that's a great way. Yeah. Yep. And that I've really found that to be true. It's just like if you if somebody gets knocked down by one by one point from a 5.0 to a 4.0 on Google, Mm -hmm. it takes 30 positives to get rid of one negative. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of times that's a negative that is just somebody that feels like their concerns were not heard. Mm -hmm. And that if if I can't get you to listen, I'm going to leave you a negative review and you know, I think a lot of business owners, if, if that was on their radar, a lot of times it's their underlings and their staff that have maybe dropped the ball somewhere. I've seen I've seen one star reviews just because they're like, I called them for an estimate and they never got back with me. Mm. Those ones we really can't do much about because obviously if they never dealt with the uh, the business, they can't go through the business's software to get to leave the review. But when I think about that, I think that is not the owner's fault in general, unless there's only, unless it's a one man show. But if it's if it's more than one person, it's part of the business. It may have been the other person that's the employee it was their job to get back with them. Well, they're having a bad day. Instead of going up the food chain and talking to the owner, these people are going on there going, well, just nobody got back to me. And it's like, that's a reason for a bad review. How can you review a business and give them a bad review when you've not done business with them? Because like, obviously if they didn't get back to you, it's one thing if they have given you an estimate and you're, you're pursuing the process and then like you try and contact them. But if, if you're just trying to say, Hey, you know, I'd like, I'd like to order a pizza from you tonight, call me back. Well, they may not have any more room on the menu to order another pizza in without a three hour wait. So why does that make them a bad business? So there's, there's, uh, I wish Google had an easier way for businesses to, you know, like you said, reporting some of them as spam. That certainly does help. Um, but there's, uh, you know, I guess all, all you can really do is it's kind of, it's kind of like putting coloring into water. If you have a drop of red dye and you only have an ounce of water in a cup, that red dye is going to color the whole cup. But if you have 30 gallons, one drop of red dye, is going to make no difference whatsoever. And so that's what we try and do is just to build up the amount of dilution for any negatives you might get. And then as many of them as we can field back and let the the uh, business owner deal with it. Yeah, that's one way. Or you could delete your Google business profile and start a new one. I'm actually... And get some new, more... Reviews. Yeah. I'm actually surprised that the business that I found that, that had... The, f- the five negatives out of 11 in, in the past year, they just changed names, but they, they did not change their Google business profile. They just named, changed the name and formally this other one. And it's like, wow, you guys should really like wipe the slate and start over. Cause mm. like, yeah. I know it's interesting too, because 
you can weaponize Google reviews against a rival business. Yeah. Which is crazy. And, and that's where, yeah, the Google reviews are important. Yeah, I mean, we a have such a number and then it gets like once you're in the thousand reviews, it doesn't really matter. Right. At that point. But, and that's at Bulletproof. But yeah, if you were like one Mexican restaurant versus another Mexican restaurant and you're both starting up at the same time, if I knew and I was shady how to really stick it to the competition. Yep. I could weaponize my friends to leave like 10 one star reviews saying all this crap. Well, see, and, and by the same token, kind of turn a positive spin on that. Um, a, you can uh, do the same thing with your friends. You can do, you promote. can do that to, to promote. And I mm-hmm. highly, re- I recommend to my businesses that they do that. Yes. Um, and the, the neat thing is our software has this thing called kiosk mode where you could literally walk around with it open on your smartphone and uh, call your friends up and say, hey, uh, give me your name and email address. I want I want you to do me a quick review on Google. I'm trying to promote my business. To me, is, I get requests from friends all the time on Facebook. They're like, hey, give my business a like. And I usually do because I've been, I've been asked. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times just people don't know how to ask. And so just like, for instance, the, uh, the Spokane Business Group, that we're part of to go there and, and have, have your kiosk open and say, all right, we're going to pass this around. Everybody, you know, that wants to go ahead and put your name and email in there. We're going to send you a link to go and review this business. And so businesses could actually do that almost like swapping business cards because why not? I mean, if, if you're familiar with the business, you know, the owner, and maybe that's all you say is, Hey, I know the owner, they're an upstanding person really love the fact that they're in business. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. It's about the war against spam. This is a real person with the real business that yep. produces real products or service. It's yep. And the nice product. thing is that um, because of how the uh, the kiosk mode works is it's coming from a link that comes from your phone and and up into like if you if you put your if put your email address in there it pops into your actual email. Like if you, if I had you review my business, it would pop into your email and would come from your Google account on your phone. And so it's not just like, oh, well, they just, you know, were spam because it came off of the business owner's phone because it doesn't. And so it's kind of neat. They've done a lot of research in how to work with the SEO and make sure that these are all, hey, these are legit. They're not just, just spam and all of that. I am not a robot like the recapture stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's important to do. And when a small business owner comes up to me and they express that they want a Google review, I give it to them because yeah. that proves to me that one that they understand the value of that digital asset. Yep. And that there is an entire asset class that has been created from the digital age even though we are now in the age of API, we're no longer in the digital age, but it's still an asset class that lingers from the digital age that people are just now coming to coming to grips with. And they have to understand this. Yes. Social proof isn't going away. Yeah. Even in API and all of that social proof is not going away. And I think a lot of times I'm, I'm like you, any business that asks me to leave a review, I will, but they have to make it streamlined because if I have to like search up the, you know, their address and make sure I'm on the right Google page and all of that, I'm less likely to do it than if I get an email with a link and it's a one click deal for me. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's kind of, you know, we're all busy but it doesn't take but two seconds for me to put my name and email into there. And when I, when I'm dealing with restaurants, that's what I tell them. I'm like, Hey, when you're, when your server is picking up the tab, have them drop off a tablet. That's, uh, you know, that they're, they're assigned to then recollect off the table and say, here, while I'm, while I'm collecting, we'd really appreciate a Google review. I get a bonus point. If you mention my name, my name is Johnny or Susan or whatever. And so then the uh you know and they can just coach the customers please please tell what you had 
and please leave us a Google review. And I've had so other people, other places say, you know, 10% off your bill next time or a free soft drink with the purchase of a meal for your next visit. Mm -hmm. And then we have a, a program that is an autoresponder. After they've uploaded the Google review, the autoresponder can say, hey, thanks for the Google review. Your code to get the free soft drink is free pop. And so mention it the next time you come in. So it's automated so that the customer just has to remember to mention it and then, you know, just limit one per customer or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah, it it makes me remember how, well, first off, Google will reward you with that sort of organic traffic driven yes. to you. And in fact, my dad with his cabinet business, he was paying 220 bucks a month to these SEO charlatans mm -hmm. that built his website for him, which was literally a bridge to nowhere. It drove him no traffic. And I said, stop doing that. You should just have a Google business profile. You don't even need a website because you're not you don't you're, he's not trying to build domain authority but right and so yeah ever since we just got him on a google business profile with no website and you know what he did he stopped paying 225 dollars to charlatans that were getting him nothing right it's all day, about results money. well and that's one of the things that i love to do for businesses we offer a 14-day test drive Cost them nothing at the end. Of, it's an opt-in program, which means I don't need billing information. I'm not going to send a bill at the end of it. Let me prove to you that this works. See how wonderful it is. And if you love it, which you probably will, then we'll talk dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. And that's the nice thing, too, is because I can say to a business, try it. Let me coach you. Let's see how it actually works. And uh, I thought when you t were talking about him paying two hundred twenty-five dollars, I thought you were going to talk about like spon a Google sponsorship, is a is pay per click and and so on and so forth. That is directly related to your Google ranking. A business that's Google ranked say fifty is going to pay about three times more per click than a Google a business whose Google rank is five. And the biggest and fastest way to get your Google rank up is by having those organic reviews showing up because Google's like, oh, everybody's talking about this guy. We'll, we'll reach out to him and we'll give him a good deal on, on promotions because he sees how important Google is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what uh, other business owners don't understand is Google is... A social media platform and your Google yep. business profile is like a Facebook profile. Absolutely like it is. profile that you are working on. In fact, it's the most important business profile because 98% of user queries come from Google. Yep. So yeah, it, fill out your Google business profile, post, update something at least three times a week. Even if it's stupid, <laughs> like, like, hey, we're alive this week. We're real people. With real the sun services. is shining and it's 48 degrees. And yeah. <laughs> we serve Mexican food and this is the best Mexican food in Spokane. And then three days later, like, hey, here's a picture of somebody eating food. Yep. And that's important, too, for people who are leaving Google reviews is machines cannot see photos machines cannot see photos you have to tell the machine what's in the photo now when you add a photo to a google review what you're doing is you're increasing the value of that review yep because you're adding additional media and on top of that if you describe the photo such as this is this is beans and rice and chicken that i ate at Hacienda's Mexican food house. This is the best Mexican food in Spokane 2023. Look at how the green onions artfully lay over the cheese and all that. Yep. And our uh, software prompts the user to include a picture with their, with their, uh, with their review. Good. So like That's right in there, right in the review, it says, would you like to add a photo? And if they click on it, it opens up the camera on their phone and they can like take a picture of the, you know, and that's something too that restaurants can offer like a free dessert if you include a photo, that kind of thing. And they can also access the files that are on, you know, if they took a picture of their food when it came out, 
You know, I know a lot of people do that. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty common. If, if I get food that's beautifully presented, I'm like, oh, I'm taking a picture of this. Mm-hmm. And uh, then if I've already got it there. And Google used to kind of follow people around and like encourage them to review places. Mm-hmm. And they quit doing that because then they started pricing their ads based on the number of reviews in the Google ranking. So they're like, well, why are we costing ourselves money by using every... And I think a lot of people got caught onto it and didn't like the whole thing of Google following them around and asking for every single review every time too. But now I think that a lot of businesses don't realize why they're getting less reviews is because Google quit doing that as an automatic service. And then a lot of users quit allowing Google to follow them around and ask them for a review because it got... When it's just every single place that you went to... Um, it's like I saw a sign on the on a uh, restroom door that had four and a half stars and said, would go potty here again. You know, it just kind of gets a bit ridiculous. And uh, and so that's that's the other thing, too, is it, because it's not happening organically anymore. The restaurants that don't or the I'm sorry, the businesses that don't employ this tactic could risk them themselves being left in the dust by those that do. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I start to wonder where the the marketing landscape is changing. And mm-hmm. from what I what I can see, one, those Google reviews are highly important for small businesses. And then two, the next thing is businesses can review themselves in mass and be very competitive through YouTube. So for example, all those questions I pulled up, like how to, uh, about like et, um, the Google reviews and whatnot. So how do I get more Google reviews? What does more Google reviews work? How do I get a hundred reviews? What are the best benefits of having more Google reviews? So if these business owners make videos, short videos, less than 60 seconds answering those questions that relate to their industry yes and then post it to their youtube what happens is well a youtube is owned by google so when people right so when people type in something into google what is going to usually now populate is going to if you have the google chrome if they're running google chrome uh what's going to populate is the video answer the short video answer is going to be higher right. than the long form video answer because people want it quick. They're yes. Like, like I'm that Google way. Reviews I'll work? yeah. Yes. More Google reviews works. No more Google reviews does not work. They, they want, they want answers. They want it quick. So the quick video answer from YouTube is the fastest way to really get a content cluster around your brand and showing that you have expertise, authority, and trustworthiness, which is something that all customers should be adding as keywords into their into their reviews is too, such as this Mexican restaurant is the most, these people are true experts at what they do. This is the most trustworthy restaurant. I think that they are the author. I hold them as the authority over all other Mexican restaurants here in Spokane. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think too. Uh, you just gave me an idea of having like even to print off a little cheat sheet to the restaurant and say, by the way, here's some things to be coaching your wait staff on on as you tell people to leave reviews. By the way, if you could mention something about the fact that we're a Mexican restaurant, the fact that we're an Italian restaurant, the fact that you like the spaghetti, make sure to mention the dish that you had. Make sure to talk about, you know, they they he you've been coming here for how many years or this is your fourth or fifth time. And that just all of those things add credibility in the in the SEO picks up on that. And I like the idea. I, I'm, I am. You, you totally described me though. When I'm, when I'm googling a question and it pops up with videos, I'm looking for two minutes or less. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not going to sit around and listen to a podcast like we're having right here just to get an answer for a question. Now, if I'm, if I'm digging deep and drilling down on something, then I certainly can, can uh, work through that. But if I'm just like, hey, how can I get better Google reviews? I should, I should be having a little YouTube commercial of saying, hey, if it's more Google reviews that you want. Here's so maybe maybe we can network and you can help me set something like that up. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that's one thing I do with the Blooming Biz Media Network. There we go. Help people get 
get shown. Yes. Yeah. So uh, talk about your international travels. Ah, well, I had never been outside of the country until 2008. And a big part of that is that I was always in ministry you know, stateside. My grandfather founded a camp in Michigan. And so while all of my friends from church were going on all these international missions trip, I spent every summer uh, working at the camp. I actually, uh, seven summers there, seven summers as a uh, um all different sorts of staff, and I spent two years full time there. My ex husband was a chairman of the board, so I was heavily involved in local ministry within the state of Michigan. Well, then the camp itself, my first international mission, the camp sponsored a missions trip, and we went to Matamoros, Mexico. And um, I'm sorry, that was not Matamoros, Mexico. We went to um, we went to Los Alamos, Mexico is where we crossed the border. And it's the only hand pulled for ferry in the entire United States. Mm. And it, it's called Los Ebenos, which is the ebony trees. And there literally is ebony trees right there. You drive down this dirt road and there's a little customs shack because it's like this little tiny building that's like 10 foot by 10 foot square. And you show your passport there. And then they have this ferry that holds three cars and there's a cable going across the Rio Grande, and the speed at which you travel across the Rio Grande is basically about how hot it is and how many Mexicans are working pulling the ferry. And so these guys are like leaning forwards and back, forwards and back, forwards and back, pulling on this cable till it pulls you across to the other side. And they all the cars? Yeah, three cars on it. Man. Yeah, yeah, it was a really cool experience. And so they pulled us across, pulled us across, pulled us across, and then they dropped the ramp. They basically imagine a little flat barge mm-hmm. with ramps on both ends. Mm-hmm. And it holds three cars, and they, they pull you across, and then it drops the ramp on the other side, and you drive off, and then the next three cars drive on, and they pull you pull them across, face it, they, the guys literally like turn around, and the, 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 the barge is hooked to the cable, so it doesn't turn or anything. The guys just turn around and start pulling it the other direction. And I think they would have bought a motor. Right? <laughs> Well, that's kind of their claim to fame is that it's the only hand-pulled yeah, ferry in the United yeah. States. And it wasn't that ever was very wrong. busy. Yeah, and that the guys said, oh, yeah, these guys these guys had some serious arms on them. I and it would be quite a workout just, uh, just constantly doing that back and forth all day. And... Um, it's kind of funny, my, my, uh, at that point in time, it was, so it was 2008, and the last time I had touched my Spanish before that was 1992 in high school. Mm-hmm. And so I was rusty, to say the least. And so at the time, my niece and nephew were little, and they liked to watch Shrek. And so I, I watched, the, I had watched the Shrek movie so many times with them that I got it memorized. And so my way to brush up on my Spanish was to watch Shrek in English with Spanish subtitles and in Spanish with English subtitles. Okay. And so that brushed me up to the point where I would like listen to Spanish being spoken and they'd be like, Lisa, did you catch any of that? I'm like, yeah, he said something about the color blue, his house, his mother in the beach, but I don't know how they go together. <laughs> and so it was funny because I would try to speak Spanish and back then that was the day of like we didn't have babble fish and stuff like that on our phones i had the little type in translators right and so i would try type in little things and like i had good enough pronunciation that i could make basic conversation but it was really rudimentary and i'm sitting down and it is it is 107 degrees in the shade and so it's really, really hot. And I sit down next to this man named Beto, who Beto was almost 80 years old. And in Mexico, they don't typically live that long. We're in this little town called San Francisco. And it was teeny tiny, like dirt roads with with cement curbs. I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, it's just, But San Francisco, Beto had the only refrigerator in the whole town. And he had the little little mini mercado, uh, super mercado, they call it. But it was just like literally a little party store out of his house. And he had eggs and milk and, and stuff like that because he had the refrigeration. And they don't really refrigerate their eggs. But anyways. Uh, so when I, you say a refrigerator, you mean like a home refrigerator? Yes. And yeah, he he had the only that. one in the village. Yeah, okay. And so he ran a little market out of his house. And so people would like walk up to this little window and they would tell him what they wanted. And so he he had like spices and flour and basic needs because you got to think he's living in a town where people do not have, he had like a chest freezer and a refrigerator. Mm-hmm. 
And he's living in a town where nobody has that. So people are buying like little small, you know, they sold basically hamburger by the patty raw and people would go home and cook the burger or, you know, chicken that was already, you know, in the, in the freezer, but it might be just, just a wing and a thigh or just, you know, whatever, but he would, he would sell it raw and then people would go home and cook it. And, um, and little chips and, you know, typical, like, sort of typical convenience store stuff but also a few of the staples because people just like there they were a long ways from the next car and i the next town and i would say only maybe one in three homes had an automobile so very very poor town and uh but so i'm sitting next to beto and it's really hot out and i'm using my limited spanish and that your spanish anybody that listens to this podcast that's like a native spanish speaker is going to start to laugh because wanting to make basic conversation i sat down and i said oye beto estoy caliente because <laughs> i had typed in i am hot into my little translator and beto raises his eyebrows and winks at me and says si sí, señorita at which point beto's uh-huh. wife runs after him with a dish towel and literally chases him off his seat going Beto, 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 Beto. And I holler for our translator. His name's Javier. I'm like, Javier, come over here. I got to know what I did. And I got to know how to do it, how to, what I do wrong and what do I need to do right. So I tell Javier what happens. He's dying of laughter. And I'm like, tell me what I did. He's like, okay, first of all, the words you want are tango calor. Just like hungry is tango hombre, which means I have hunger. I'm too warm means I have warmth, which is tango oh, calor. I said, yo soy mucho caliente. Yes, like, there you go. Really <laughs> and that's the thing is I, I told Beto that I, like I was a hot mama kind of hot. Mm, gotcha, <laughs> like, gotcha. I, like I think I'm a hot chick. <laughs> <laughs> which at which point and Beto's wife apparently knew enough of, of what was going on that she knew how he was kind of you know teasing me a little bit and flirting and it was just hilarious because like that was like and I've had another really funny fa- Spanish faux pas in uh but that fast forward to let's see I went I went on that trip that was 2008 I turned around and went back to Mexico in 2009 I went again in 2011 to uh, El Salvador and Guatemala. And then I went in 2014 to the Dominican Republic. Now, when I went on the second trip in 2009, I met a man from my area that went to a bilingual church. And he knew that I spoke a little bit of Spanish and we got talking. I said my best way of learning Spanish was hearing songs that I knew in English Mm. being sung in Spanish, especially if I had good translation work. Mm. He says, I can do you one better. Not only do we sing our songs both ways because our church is bilingual, my pastor is bilingual, and he would preach a a sentence in English and the sentence and self-translate into Spanish. Mm. And because it was the same person saying it, the translation was just amazing. And so, like, it's funny because my sermon notes would, would also have on the sideline, oh, this this is the Spanish word for that. This is the Spanish word for that. It's funny. I don't know any of the Spanish swear words because I learned all my Spanish in, in high school and church. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was, it was uh, funny, though, because by the time I got to 2014, I had, I had uh, went with a uh, ministry out of Emily City, Michigan, and the, the, there was a, a Mexican man that was our, was our host, and we went down to the Dominican Republic. But he, we get down there, and he's like, in Spanish, telling everybody, don't speak English to her, speak Spanish. She's fluent. She doesn't know how good she is in Spanish. And uh, so I, because I had really been working on it and trying to build up my Spanish skills. And so they were like basically instructed. If you know, if you're bilingual, don't, don't let it show. Well, I'm working with this little 13 year old bilingual boy from Puerto Rico. And kid had the most incredible sense of humor of uh, pretty much anybody I've ever met on uh, anywhere, let alone on a missions trip. And so <laughs> Gabrielle and I are scooping b- uh, big bags of beans and rice into smaller bags to feed to the poor. Well, we're scooping the beans. The other group is scooping the rice and we're going slower and they're get, they're like, ha ha ha, we're going to be done with our bag first. And anytime I don't know a word, I'll just throw like an A, an E or an O on the end of it especially if I know the person that I'm talking to is somewhat mm-hmm. bilingual. And so I say to Beto, meaning scoop faster, I said, rapido es scoope. Mm-hmm. He starts dying laughing. And I'm like, whoops, wrong word, right? And he's like, yeah, and I'm laughing so hard that I can't think of the root word you want. Because, of course, he's bilingual and he can talk mm-hmm. back to me in English. I'm like, so, and, and so what I had said, escupe is spit. 
Mm. So I had just told a, a 13 year old kid to spit in the beans. <laughs> And so the entirety of that trip, I would hear him telling people in Spanish the whole story of the spit in the beans thing. And then he would turn to me and he would say, and ella dice, which means, and she said, Mm -hmm. and I would say, rapido escupe. And so like we had this little comic act that we did the whole trip. That was there for 10 days. So this little comedic act, he would tell the story and then he would turn to me when it was my turn to say, rapido escupe, and everybody would laugh. And so it was just, it was super fun and um, saw some really cool things. The the 2008 missions trip, the first day that we arrived, we had uh, a group of kids come running over saying, please come pray for our grandmother because she is needing dialysis. She can't even get out of the bed to go and get dialysis done. And I'm telling you, this woman was on death's door. She was all swelled up, like her fingers, she couldn't make a fist, like she was that badly swollen. And we all gathered around and we prayed for her. And two days later when we left, she was sitting in her wheelchair waving at us from under the tree. That's amazing. And yeah, so God, I've, I've seen God do some incredible things and heal, heal people and stuff like that. The craziest thing that ever happened to me, my um, the fire safety company I'm part of, allows you to earn a company trip Mm -hmm. and the company trip that I earned was to Cancun and I'm like well I've never been to Mexico and not had it be a mission strip and so my friend's like well make it a mission strip I'm like how do I do that she's like google it (laughs) just like we're talking about I literally googled Baptist Church Cancun and I came up with a a church that was founded in 1982 by a guy with Baptist Midmissions which was an organization my church already supported as a as a whole organization so it's kind of like finding a cousin Mm-hmm. And so I contacted him. I said, listen, all my airfare and everything is covered. I just want a ministry outlet. My background, I said, I've, I've done a lot of different things. But that particular trip, I was bringing a friend with me who was 30 years a missionary. Um, she did balloon twisting and magic and um, singing and object lessons. And so I said, you know, can we build something around that? And he's like, yeah, I'd love to have you teach a, like little mini workshops in the evenings for our uh, youth workers and we'll do a feed for the poor. So it was kind of double faceted. So we did a feed for the poor and then every night we had a workshop. And then the, the night before we left, we did a, a big like a, a, we went down to their open air plaza and did a street outreach. And so we brought sound systems down and all of that. And they were able to apply everything that they learned. So they could do the balloons. They could do all of that. And it was neat because their youth pastor came up to me and he said to me, he said, I know why you're here. And I'm like, okay. And he was bilingual. And he says, you're here because I prayed you here. I'm like, what? Okay. He says, I twist balloons. And he said, I was literally thinking about just putting Bible verses on a sign behind me and making balloons to get people to come up and read the Bible verse because I knew nothing about how to connect the two ministries. Mm -hmm. And he says, and you come down here and you're showing us how to do the the story of creation and the armor of God and the story of Jonah and the whale and all of these things with the balloons that I already have. And he says, I was praying last November that God would show me how to use this particular thing that I love making balloons in ministry. And he says in the very next Sunday, Pastor Smith tells us that he's got a couple of Americans coming to teach us. I don't believe in coincidences. Not at all. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, and it's just like... There's too many cases like that. Oh, it gets even cooler. Jill and I, um, Jill, like I said, Jill's older than me. She's been in ministry for 30 years. And so we're, we're trying to dovetail this, right? And, we, and we, we, in addition to doing the workshops, they also had us take over the Sunday morning service. And so I had been pestering her. Like we did the company trip part of it for the first three days and the last four days were ministry. So for the first three days, I'm like, can we please sit down and go over what you're going to talk about and what I'm going to talk about and see how it dovetails together, make sure we're not duplicating. Because her and I have kind of similar backgrounds. She's like, oh, I've been doing ministry in 30 years. We'll just put you on first. And I'm like, no, I want to like figure this out. And so so finally, like the Saturday night, right before we're going to talk, t- talk on Sunday, she goes through with me what she's going to talk about. And then I'm like, well, that's wonderful. That'll fit with this. And I'll, I won't talk about that because you're talking about this. And this will fit with that. And we're kind of sharing our testimony, how, what God had done in our lives. Great. We go to the, go to the church Sunday morning, talk through the, the whole thing. It goes really, really well. The pastor says to us after the service, he said, we have a church plant this downtown in Mexico, or downtown Cancun, rather, that 
is a whole different audience. Can you please do the same thing you just did for us, for them, at, tonight, at their evening service tonight? Fine, no problem. And he starts talking more about the, the service. The pastor of that church, because it's downtown, it's in, the, it's in what they call the hotel worker's zone. And so Mac Cancun, Mexico is divided into quadrants. And so there's, there's the strip where all the businesses and hotels are. And then there's another area that where the businesses that serve the people that live there. So like the beauty salons and the cleaners and the, all of that that serve the people who live in the town. And then you have the business owners section and then you have the so workers the peasants. Exactly. And it very much is. I mean, everything's concertina wire. Oh. The craziest thing I ever saw was driving down the street and there was like a six month old kid that's like not even hardly old enough to crawl. This this child did not get out there by itself, sitting outside a locked gate on the sidewalk with nobody around, mm -hmm. crying his eye his or her eyes out. And I'll never forget the image of that baby because I wonder what happened to that kid. How did that kid end up there? Did the did the babysitter like need to go somewhere and the people weren't home so they just brought the baby and like set them outside the gate because the gate was locked or was a kid crying and dad thought it'd be an okay idea to like lock lock the baby outside the gate mm -hmm. uh, what and then what happened to that baby did it finally get the family to come pick it up and like it's like oh things you would never consider in america things like, you can't like unsee you saw that in america somebody would be some some authority would get involved yeah yeah in yeah some way and, and things you just can't unsee. It's like that is burned in my memory of just like culturally, how is this even possible? And it was in a neighborhood where literally like a child snatcher could have just walked down and like picked that baby up and that would have been end of story. But so I, so anyways, we were kind of in that kind of a neighborhood, but we went, you know, we were safe because we were with native Mexicans and we were going to a church service and we were just going in and back. And so we go into this church service and... I do my little thing and I get, you know, I'm working with a translator and all of that. And then the pastor gets up and like we had told the story of Adam and Eve and the story of Jonah and the, and the whale. And kind of like we had this whole spiel that Jill and I did together and we kind of knew it well because we had just done it that morning. And the gals that, that were with us that were translators, when the pastor got up and spoke, I'm sitting there going, my goodness, he must have been sitting back on Google, like looking up references for every single thing that we talked about because he went back through our sermon almost in the same order with key points pulled out about every single topic. I'm like, wow, that is really cool. And they kept turning around as if I didn't understand. They're like, he's talking about what you talked about. He's talking about what you talked about. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can understand enough English, enough Spanish to know what he's talking about. It wasn't until we left the church that I realized, because I heard the two of them talking very excitedly, they had not seen our morning service, but they had seen his. Mm. He gave the exact same sermon Sunday night as he had given Sunday morning. And his sermon was point for point, word for word, as if he had built it around the very talk that we gave. Coincidence? I think not. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's just God. I've seen God do some very, very incredible things. No, no one will be ever able to, to say to me that, that, that God doesn't exist. I've seen it. I've, I've felt it. You know, what, what, what is the apostle Paul says that which we have seen and heard and held in our hands, we give to you. And I really feel like that's some of the things that I've been allowed to do three different mission trips. And I've traveled for, for pleasure. You know, I've been to Jamaica. I've been to Bahamas. I've been to England and Scotland and Iceland and places like that. But it's really the, the mission trips are the ones that made the deepest impact. Yeah, it would seem like you'd come back with a deep appreciation for the things that you have. Oh, my goodness. Just when I went to Guatemala, there was like these people had nothing. They shared a clothesline in this little village. I mean, they, they had absolutely nothing. But I've, I've never before or since seen people worship God with such a true sense of joy. With just, I mean, they were just, they were just letting it all out there. And they were so, they were thankful for things that we take for granted. When those people prayed, they would thank God, not only for sending his son, but thank him for his grace, thank him for his mercy, thank him for his ability to change lives, thank him for making the grass grow and making the sun shine and for seeing us through the hard times. 
And like things that we just, you know, somebody says, what are you thankful for? A lot of times we're going, well, I'm thankful for my house or my car or this or that. And you, we miss the point of like all of these things that have been given to us in the heavenly realms. These people were genuinely like over the moon happy about. And we just, we take them for granted. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, America is a Disneyland fantasy yeah. compared to the real world. And a lot of Americans suffer from affluenza. <laughs> and they don't I like that yeah, affluenza. Well, it's a real condition. Yes, um, for sure. Yeah, and they they suffer from affluenza to where they you know, they you, you see it. I could harp yep. on it all day, but that's just the reality. The fact is you go to these countries, there is no 911. Uh-huh. Like what are you going to do if you get stabbed or yeah. shot or you fall from something and you are break something what are you gonna do go to their go to their their i mean you are putting yourself in risk i mean you didn't even talk about like antibiotics prior to going i did not do i i I was thankfully never in an area where like malaria like prep was a Mm -hmm. thing and so I didn't really worry about that where we were going. I did, however, find out after I got back um, when they found out I had been to Guatemala and El Salvador, I couldn't give blood for a year. Mm-hmm. And which I find ironic because it's like, can't you just test my blood? Can't you just put it like a thing? But then I did more research. Malaria is actually a parasite. And so they can't just test your blood and say, are you positive or aren't you? Because it could still have like the unhatched parasites mm-hmm. in it. And so yeah. that's, that, that's a whole other like deep dive discussion of, of why uh, ivermectin and mm-hmm. hydroxychloroquine, which are both antiparasitics mm-hmm. are, are so effective mm-hmm. against COVID-19 and things like that. And uh, that's just, there's, there's a parasite connection. I can't, I can't describe it. I don't have documentation on it, but I'm as sure of it as I am the day long. Mm-hmm. I've got a friend that, until he realized what he what he was up against, he got COVID, and every thirty days would lose his smell for three days. Mm-hmm. And he says, then he started following the moon cycle. He's a farmer, mm-hmm. and farmers know the moon cycle is what determines parasite hatches in the animals. That's what mm-hmm. you watch for because, like, if you treat them for parasites, you watch at the next moon cycle, make sure that they're not showing signs. Mm-hmm. And if they are, you hit them again because something didn't quite get killed because it was an egg form and usually two moon cycles and, you, and you've and you got it, maybe three. And he started taking um, walnut husk. And walnut husk is a natural antiparasitic. And his Good sense of thought. smell has never left again. They say you want to learn something new, read an old book. And yep. It, it makes me think about how, how back when we were an agrarian mm. nation, and how like the farmer's almanac was given out like it's the Bible, right? For farmers like you need to know the yep. signs and seasons. Yep, yeah, that's a really fascinating thing. I think that's really cool. Well, we're at we got it's at three twenty right now. The thing starts at three thirty. So okay, we might as well wrap this up. So sure, it's been fantastic to be here. Yeah. I have very much enjoyed. Um, a lot. And, uh, one more thing about international travel yeah. before we wrap up, probably the single coolest non-missionary thing that I got to do. Um, I was traveling to Scotland and I didn't find out I was going to Scotland until it was like a last minute thing while I uh, tagged onto a trip to England. And, uh, so it was three weeks between when I was going to leave. And so I, I con- contacted my aunt cause I'm of Scottish descent. And I said, 10 years ago, when you went to Scotland, what did you find? And so she gave me everything that she found. I did some more research and I was able to find connections to people and places and things. And I literally went on the internet through Facebook actually, and went on to the marketplace pages of the towns of people where my ancestors were from. And I said, I'm related to these people and these places and this town and this, there were, I knew there was a farm called whole house farm. And I, because of that, and this is, there's a whole other podcast within, <laughs> within this, mm-hmm. I was able to meet my fifth cousins who were born on that farm and I have dinner, have tea in the uh, farmhouse kitchen, which the farm has been sold out of the family for, since the 1960s. And the, my cousins had never been on the inside since the new, new owners had bought it. 
And so that all dovetailed together. And I met my uh, 11th cousin and her and I together went to the castles that my 10th grandfather and her 11th, no, her 10th grandfather, my 11th grandfather built. And we went there, we took a tour. How did and that feel? So we walk in and the curator is like, so ladies, what brings you to Keneal House? And uh, she said, she speaks first. She's like, I actually only live in Denny 20 miles away, but I've never been here. And I really should come because he was my 10th great grandfather. And he says, oh, a descendant. I should be curtsying. He says, in order to work here, you've got to be connected. And my great, 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 great grandfather was a god and a for your great, 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 great grandfather. And she's like, oh, that's wonderful. And he says, and who's your friend? And I open up my mouth and speak in my American accent and I say, I'm actually a Yankee over here on holiday coming here because her and I met because of Keneal House. He's my 11th great grandfather. And he stiffens up and he says, as I live and breathe, two, I've got two descendants. It's never happened. It's never happened to me. And you know each other because of here. And so that was like the over the moon highlight of all my trips to. Did you to... begin drinking on the spot? Because <laughs> that sounds like a joke. Like they'd be like, yeah, let's call for a celebration. Well, yeah. and it, he, he did. He called <laughs> Ian. He called Ian, the president of the, of the museum association and says, Ian, get down here. You're doing this tour. He says, there's two descendants standing right, right here in front of me. The American who's coming has brought their friend and she's local and she's a descendant too. You need to come because apparently he was like the top guy that knew the most about so we got our own private tour of the of the castle and of the museum that must and have been cool I it was insane like cool torture chambers or no something. we didn't go we couldn't actually go inside the castle oh. because it's in too bad of a state of disrepair right, right. but we were totally able to like walk the grounds and learn about isaac watts's co cottage out back the hamiltons were covenanters so they were a little bit anti-establishment but also the coolest thing we found out through that was that the Hamil it was it was James Hamilton and Margaret Douglas were in 1534 I believe is the year okay so we're talking back in the day mm -hmm. and they were first cousins of Mary Queen of Scots mm -hmm. and while Mary Queen of Scots was a baby in hiding in France the Hamiltons were reigning regents of Scotland Interesting. and today in the Queen's court or the King's court I guess it is now the guy that carries the pillow with the crown, that's actually the crown of Scotland. And that is Lord Hamilton, who is a like eighth cousin. So it's like, that's kind of cool. Interesting. Yeah. And so just things you, things you find out like just organically that just kind of happen to you. And so I can, I can, sometime we could go and talk that about genealogy. Like a cool trip. Oh, like it was a awesome. Once in a lifetime thing. Yes. Where it's like ancestor hunting. Yes. And it's like ancestor in this episode of Ancestor Hunters. Yes. Find and it was funny because I'm part of a few different genealogy groups and one of them does ask, hey, do you have a, a pair of ancestors who you feel like wanted you to find them? And the, the Hamilton family is definitely one that I feel that way about because that's not the Scottish name that came to yeah, me. that's what I meant, like feel. Mm-hmm. feel like you were meant to be. Oh, I, I feel like James Hamilton and Margaret Douglas... Like, I'm not into clairvoyance and stuff like that, because obviously as a Christian, that goes against my beliefs. But I believe that I was supposed to find them, because in preparing for my trip to Scotland, I was looking at the revolution, or not the revolution, the reformation. Because I'm like, because that happened over there. Because my first trip to England, I saw a bombed out building that was still bombed out from World War II. Mm. And I'm just like, that just made it so real to me. It's just like, they left us here to remind us. Like all the things we hear about as American kids in school happened over there. And so I'm like, well, so did the, you know, the Reformation obviously started in Germany, but it came all the way across Europe and it hit the, it hit the British Isles pretty hard. And so I was researching for that. And there was a special type of artwork where they would take all the burlesque pictures that were painted right on the walls and they paint over them with heavy plaster because they didn't have kills back then. Mm -hmm. And then they would purposely paint them black and white, these really, really intricate, 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 almost tattoos on the walls with with this raised black ink and there was a special type of artwork and there's only three places in the world that can be seen because of the later wars between the catholics and protestants hmm. 
And Keneal House was one of the places. And so I was researching that and the Reformation, and then I saw that it was owned by a Hamilton. I'm like, oh, it's a castle. I wonder who owns it. Hamilton. I'm like, wait a minute. I saw a Hamilton in my family tree as one of the people who married into the Clellans. Clelland is the closest Scottish name that came to me. My great-granddad's mother was a Clelland, and they were always very proud of their Scottish roots. And uh, I remember Grandpa used to say, the Clellans are good stock. Mm. And uh, always thought he said that because he raised horses, right? Mm Mm-hmm. I got a book called The Ancient Family of Keneland, which is just like spelled like knee, K-N-E-E, with an apostrophe between the K and the N. Keneland became later Cleland and Cleland and mm. Cleland with two L's or one L. And there was a town called Cleland from where the old estate used to be. And in the book, it's in this book was written in 1899. So old, old book. In the book, it said, no matter how you spell it, the Clellands are good stock. And I was like, whoa, that's like something that somebody way, way back, because this the book takes it takes the family tree all the way back to 1240 uh, to the 1200s. And Alexander Keneland was married to the sister of William Wallace's father. So he was Wallace's uncle. And William Wallace, if you're familiar with Scottish history, mm-hmm. is Braveheart. Yeah, that's my favorite movie. If it's your favorite movie, you know when he goes back and he finds out that his whole family's been murdered? Mm-hmm. And then he moves in with Parson his, O'Gowry. His uncle, yeah. That's Alexander so Keneland. His uncle was, okay. God, that's uncle that's Argyle. my... Tr- uncle Argyle. Uncle Argyle. Yeah, yeah, but it's not. Well, it's my it's, favorite movie, so of course. Yeah, I it's actually Parson O'Gowry, according to Scottish tradition, okay. who taught him to love Latin and love freedom. And so the cry, freedom, yeah. actually came from my 24th great grandfather. Brutal world back then. Oh, man. Oh, man. And, and the, Them people the, were not uh, nice. These little phrases have lasted throughout the years. Yeah, to think the Clelands, the Clelands are good stock. Has, and then another crazy family deal. So I told you about getting married in 2020. There was Cle- a, a kid by the name of, last name of Cleland in my high school class. And I was always like, mom, are we related? Cause it's a town of 800 people. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, we don't think we're related. We were Cleland. They were Cleland, different people, whatever. Well, then I got doing more research and found out Clellans and Clelands are connected through the Canelans. Mm-hmm. And so I, while I was home packing up, knowing I was moving to Idaho, I decided to hunt up my Cleland relatives because now I know we're related. Right. And I was really big into genealogy at that time anyways. So I hunt him up and they're like, you have to meet Kurt. And so they call over Kurt and Kurt's a grandfather in the family. He, when he finds out why I'm wanting to connect with him, pulls out a little pouch. And he says, I went to Scotland 15 years ago and I brought back this. And he proceeds to lay in front of me my 15th great grandfather's wax seal with the family crest on it. Oh, cool. He preserved that for a long time. He bought it at a pawn shop, cost him 1,500 pounds. Ouch. And I'm, he's like, I, I couldn't leave it behind. He said, this is Cleland family history. He's got it. And he had the money, you know. Yeah. Well, then, because of teaching fire safety, I knew a guy 1500, that... 1,500, that's like times three. No, one and a half, USD. one yeah, and a half, whatever. but yeah. yeah and so, lot. and so he then, uh, proceeds to let me use it to stand. They actually, <laughs> the crazy thing is I met him at a, uh, township hall. They were having a fundraiser for a little community thing. And because this township hall was so old, they actually had sealing wax. Like, so we took out real sealing wax and lit the end of it. And put a drop of it on a, just an old book they had there in their book sale called The Cousin Conspiracy. And I was able to make an actual seal with this seal. And so I actually got to use the wax seal with real sealing wax, like they would have sealed a, mm-hmm. a letter. And so that blew my mind. And then I got ready to get married. That sounds fun. And I wanted, that seems like a fun ASMR. Oh, it was like, yeah, it was just a, a neat to think that my 15th great grandfather did the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. And so then when I got ready to get married, I knew a guy just through my associates who haven't lived in Michigan, Michigan my whole life. He was a pewter, uh, like a, a really high end 
pewter sculptor. Like Stan Lee has sculptures of Marvel Comics that this dude made. And he just is this unassuming, very eccentric man that lives in the Thumb of Michigan. Like a like, person who makes silver sculptures? Pewter. You know, they kind of look like silver. But he also, he did, like, props for movies. Like very similar to the guy that has the studio at at the old Magco on Trent. The guy that makes all it, like, you know what I'm talking about? Across from the pottery room. There's the guy that has the studio that, like, he was making all the little shop of horrors, little plant uh, you might not i don't oh well, i do i just i'm just trying to think like i'm thinking so he's a mind, sculptor like, like, okay so he's a sculptor i'm thinking in my mind like he's a sculptor of like like silver statues nope and, like little pewter miniatures that are okay, like that so are like, like little army dudes little army dudes Back but he made he or, made one so. by commission for stan lee of all the of all the marvel characters that's cool yeah I mean, and he's done work for Hollywood, and he's he's you know got all sorts of really funky stuff around his around his place. But anyways, because I knew him, I'm like, hey, I know of this like actual antique seal. Could you make me a a relief of it? Mm-hmm. And he was able to then we he used a special type of putty, and we took it over and and made the wax made it like made a mold of this wax seal and then i gave everybody that came to my wedding a medallion with this ancient That's family That's crest exactly what i would do too. yes like if 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 you knew a relative spent a pretty penny on a piece of wax no no this was a steel that imprinted the wax yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean you what i'm saying is he gave you the, the he found the the seal right yeah the, the the wax, correct? No. No. Okay. This is the stamp. Okay. This, right. is the, this is the this is the metal stamp that okay. makes the makes the gotcha. wax. In my mind, I was thinking in the bag was just a piece of wax. No, in the and bag like, was the actual okay. the mm-hmm. actual. You've the seen you've gotcha. yeah you've I seen it on yeah. About. Now you know what you're talking about. Where they would melt the wax and they would do yeah, that. I just wasn't sure if it was like a seal from a previous no. document that uh-uh. we had. Okay, no, this so was the, the yeah, because this was the stamper. Wax that was stamped, I'd be like, how do I know that? Oh, and it gets know? even wilder. So we're when it, rewinding to my trip to Scotland, I come home, I pick the Airbnb based on location only. I'll mm-hmm. tell you this and then I'll, then I'll wrap up. And I go home to home to the Airbnb and I'm talking to the lady and she's like, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're talking about the Hamiltons of Keneal House, right?" I said, "Yes." She says, "Me father's been dead for 4 years to, on Sunday." She says, he could have told you how we're related. We are descended from the same Jim Sandleton. We used to go to Keneal House for family events. My father's got a custom weave Royal Hamilton Tartan kilt. Hmm. And if you know anything about kilts, like you can't just go and buy a Royal one. You've got to prove your lineage and all that. Hmm. She's like, show me in your app how you're, how, you're, how you're related. So I showed her. I'm like, there, 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 there. And she's like, I need to talk to my mom. She says, but have you, have you bought a kilt yet? I said, I haven't, but it's on my bucket list for this trip. She says, me, me brothers would never be thin enough to wear Papa's kilt. And he's been gone four years, and Mom and I were just talking about it. It shouldn't just be sit, allowed, to, allowed to just sit in the closet and rot. She said, you've got the lineage that you could take it home. She says, I'll talk to Mom. The man had spent 500 pounds just for the 12-yard kilt. This sucker is heavy. And it's a custom weave done by Highland Weavers. Because it's not st- standard Hamilton kilt, which looks kind of like a Christmas plaid. This is a deep blue that that designated, you know, that's like the difference between the the white hat on a fire chief and the black hat on the on the regular firefighters. And long story short, her mom sold me the kilt, the sporn, the ghillie shirt, the the hat, two pairs of hose, the flaggings, the whole nine yards for a hundred pounds. Sweet. And just the kilt alone, the man had paid to have custom made at 500 pounds. That doesn't include any of the extras. And so it's it's a family kilt mm-hmm. that I'm allowed. It looks a little, really, people guess it as Black Watch. And they're like, that looks like Black Watch, but it's not quite. And I'm like, I brought this from Scotland. And then when I when I uh, got ready to get married, um, my mom's like, you know, you're, we had to get married on a Tuesday night because of a serious, a series of just weirdness. And, and so we got married on a Tuesday night at the church I grew up in. 
but because it was kind of a second marriage for us both and, and he didn't want to fly with the suit and all that, he got married, we, and he's half Irish, mm-hmm. and we got married in the kilt that I brought back from Scotland. He was wearing the kilt, and I was wearing like a traditional Scottish dress. That's cool. So, yeah, and we had tablet, and we had shortbread, and we had the quake ceremony. Like, we, we themed the whole wedding around a Scottish theme. That's a lot of fun. Oh, it was awesome. That seems like it was just a, like you dreamed it up and then you made it. It was a fairy tale. It was a fairy tale. It absolutely was. And we put the wedding together in a month because I was going to come back out here and stay out here for a winter. So I'd known him for longer. Mm -hmm. But my mom was like, why are you, are you sure he's the one? I'm like, I'm sure he's the one. She's like, you're just waiting for time to pass. She's like, you got to have somewhere else to live and you got to have all, you know, all, all these other complications if you wait till spring to get married and you won't get married with all the people that know you your whole life. You get married with your new friends out there. She says, if you wait, you're not going to fly back here to get married. Mm. Fly him in, get married. That solves the housing issue. And that's what we did. Cool. And so in one month, I put together a complete Scottish Celtic wedding with, you know, the only thing I didn't have was a piper. <laughs> Must <laughs> but, have been cool. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. So, it's, uh, All right. well, where can people get a hold of you, Lisa? Yeah, they can get a hold of me uh, through the QR code, which you'll you'll post, and through yeah, the post through the, the link. link. In the video description um, below. They, yep, they can also email me. My email address is gods dot grip g o d s period g r i p, no apostrophe or anything. And that's at yahoo dot com. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. This is a great conversation. Be sure to like, subscribe, and smash that bell for more updates.